with Fabio Alves. How do I pronounce your name? Alves. Fabio Alves. Alves. Yeah. From Brazil. Yes, that's it. Fabio, tell us briefly what you do professionally. Well, professionally, I'm a professor for translation studies at Federal University of Minas Gerais, mm. so that's central Brazil, mm. southeast as we call it. And um, so I'm in charge of what we call LETRA. LETRA is the Laboratory for Experimentation in Translation, where we do empirical experimental research in translation, mainly with a focus on expertise in translation mm -hmm. and development of translation competence. Mm -hmm. We work with several language pairs, I mean the languages of instructions at our university, which would be Portuguese of course, as a, a language mm. so to speak. And then we have English and German and French, Italian and Spanish, mm -hmm. besides the traditional classical Latin Greek, but we don't do translation studies with those two languages, okay. basically. Okay. And you're looking at a process, more yes. than product or both? Well, we do both. Mm -hmm. We do both. I mean, I work with two other colleagues. We are three people or three researchers in the lab. And then we work with a number of, let's say, 10 to 12 PhD students, depending okay. on... Yeah, but it's quite a few students and then uh, MA students. And we also have yeah. undergraduate studies working as, you know, so kind of assistants to research and all that. So it's kind of a large group. Pretty... We're talking about 40 people together. Wow. And who, yeah. who are your guinea pigs then? Who are your translators? Well, yes, so that, that's interesting because uh, we started off, as most people in translation studies do, looking at professional translators and novice translators. Mm -hmm. But then, since we really wanted to map expertise in translation and have a look at translation as a task performed by different people, mm. we started looking at bilinguals who were not necessarily translators, and more recently we started working with domain specialists. I mean, these are yeah, physicists, that's, that's nuclear yes. scientists or medical stuff, who actually translate from time to time their own research outputs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting because in some cases these people tend to prefer their own work to translators' mm -hmm. professional work. And then we thought it might be interesting. So the idea is just that we look at the whole client, you know, so tapping into different profiles and then assessing them, giving them different tasks, you know, so different uh, intervening factors such as removing consultation, lookups or that matter, or I introducing time pressure or, you know, so trying to look at directionality so that we can actually see how they perform when circumstances change. You're using what kind of methodologies then? Okay, so what kind of tools are you yeah, using? Basically, again, as most people in translation studies, we started off with TAPS, Think About mm -hmm. Protocols, that's a while ago. Then with the advent of keylogging, translog, you know, it's developed by Antle Jakobsen at CBS, Denmark. So we started doing work using TAPS more recently or later retrospective protocols, not concurrent think mm -hmm. about no. retrospective protocols. That's, that's when people talk about their translation. Yes, after yes, the after they've done yes, that, right. immediately after yeah. they've done that. Mm -hmm. So we call it immediate retrospection. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we, more recently, as from 9, 2008, we started doing eye tracking in conjunction with key logging. Mm -hmm. And then, as we had eye tracking, key logging, and think aloud, uh, we thought, okay, now we have to look more closely into what is generated, but not in terms of product, but not really in terms of evaluating that product, but in terms of treating that product from the perspective of corpus linguistics, so that mm -hmm. we could actually see the unfolding of the translation process, both in real time, mm -hmm. but also as different products as they emerge along the production line. So that's oh, okay. what we do. Basically, so you will we get don't different look at stages the, of yeah, the translation. We call mm -hmm. yeah. these bits or these units macro units, or they are a sequence of micro units. The micro units are the time intervals that we get with translog and eye tracking. And then we have revisions and changes, either online or as an end revision phase. We group them all, we have uh, a search engine that does that semi-automatically so you can actually get a block 
which we call a macro unit, which goes from the first reading to the final one. Mm -hmm. okay. we, 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 we look at that kind of... So the product. process and product are yeah. joining yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. they're joining up. Yeah. They're joining up. Great. Can you tell us anything that translators don't already know? Don't already about, know. Or we're not aware of, perhaps. Well, I, mean, I it's think it's not just what they don't know, but as you said, they are not aware of. Mm -hmm. And that's what we are really interested yeah. in. And that's why we carry out retrospective interviews, you know, retrospective protocols, after, uh, or as a post-task uh, investigation, so that what we do is just to look or try and look at translators' metacognitive activity. Mm -hmm. So to tap into... So that, that means the translators thinking about what they're thinking about when they're working. Yes, yes, yes exactly, yes, yes. exactly. But that's sometimes thinking about what they think they thought about, yeah. and not exactly about what they thought about. And that's, for instance, in line with expertise studies. Mm -hmm. What we see is just that, I mean, that would be an assumption, more expert translators would have higher levels of metacognitive activity and therefore they would be in a position to tell you what they did. And what we really want to see is whether they can do that. Okay. So Good. basically that's what I think they might not be aware they of. They might be better at lying too. Yeah, yeah. I think, okay, all right. <laughs> I, I want to go back to when you were beginning, uh, when you were the age when one does doctoral studies, mm -hmm. early 20s, mid 20s. What, what were you doing at that stage? How right. Did, how I mean, did you get from there to Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, In my case, I started off slightly later than usual. I was older when I started off for a simple reason that I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I graduated very young, 22 but in economics, not in language, not in anything related to this. Yes. So I had a degree in economics and management, started working and didn't like it. I was 25 at the time. And I was making quite good money at the time mm -hmm. and everybody thought that was kind of strange that I would give it all up for nothing. Yes. And yes. then I said, well, I'll start traveling around the world. I mean, I've been to Europe before, I had lived in England, I had lived in Germany as an exchange student, and then uh, I had languages and I had a formal training. And I said, so oh, your, your languages would be? Portuguese, Portuguese English, German, Spanish, and a bit of French. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. And a bit of Italian. <laughs> okay, yeah. But then uh, I worked basically with English, German, uh, Portuguese, and Spanish. Okay. I mean, two Romance and two Germanic languages. But basically what I did is just I started traveling. I went to India and China, went around the world basically for three years. And by the end of those three years, I realized that what I really liked was just working with languages. Mm -hmm. And then one of these fun, funny things that happen in life, you don't really know where you're heading, but life takes you along. I got an invitation to work in Baghdad for a construction company and they needed someone with the kind of background I had, a bit of management and a bit of language, to run or to be in charge of what they called their general secretariat, which was basically the logistics behind the project. And incidentally, the translation department of that company was under the general secretariat. And I became responsible for that without mm -hmm. doing much translation myself. So, but I really liked it. And uh, so, I wasn't translating much at the time. I was more like looking at translation output, coordinating the services, and just having final checks. But then I had a very particular, specific task. I had to negotiate those translations with the Iraqi agencies. So they had to accept them as translations, mm -hmm. officially. Mm -hmm. And that was very interesting. And then I left because um, I wanted to continue traveling and uh, the money I made in Iraq around that time, it was just a short stay, six months. Uh, this is well that. prior to any wars, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. there was this Iran, Iraq-Iran war. Oh, that was ten, 10 years. So, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that was yeah. Kind of, well, anyway, so I left and then I thought, well, it's time to go back to university and that get some formal training in translation. And then I was very fortunate to be accepted in an MA program without having a language degree in the first place. And then uh, when I started off 
and then my professors realized that, that uh, I had done some work in Iraq. They said, but you have field work already. Mm. So it's all in there. So that started off and I did an, an MA thesis quite quickly. It was mm. just much shorter than the usual. Which university? Mm -hmm. It was in Brazil, the same university I work in, in now in yeah. Minnesota. Yeah. And you're from there, right? You? Yes, I'm from okay. there. I'm from um, there. And then things went really well that by the end of the MA, I was offered the grant to do a PhD in Germany. So there was a DAG, CARPC, NPQ, Brazilian Research Agency agreement. And then uh, I had the chance to go to Germany. I found a supervisor, Frank Koenitz in Bochum. And they were doing process studies at the time. Things were just beginning. I mean, it was 1990 at the time. and. Uh, Process-oriented studies had been going on, let's say, for some four years or five years at the latest with Hans Kring's uh, PhD work and all that. So Bochum was perhaps the right place to be mm -hmm. at that time. And uh, as I said before, people did think aloud studies and what I did was to carry out a think aloud protocol study looking at translations produced from German into Portuguese but looking at two different angles or two different process lines, if you will. How Portuguese or European Portuguese did that and how Brazilian Portuguese mm -hmm. did that. So we carried out field work, like so data collection, both in Portugal and in Brazil, and we looked at different uh, profiles. We had professional translators, bilinguals, uh, young translators and students, of the translation students. And what we did at the time was they, each one of them translated two tasks and they did think aloud and we were looking at basically cultural differences but in the pragmatics domain. So what is mm -hmm. it that made them arrive or solve problems in a certain way and arrive at certain decisions based on their cultural background, although they were basically processing the same language. So it's got narrow linguistics uh, in that case. Yes, it got down to linguistics. But it's very cognitive. Yes, a cognitive approach to linguistics and basically I drew on relevant theories for mm -hmm. Wilson's work to do that kind of work. Okay. Blending cognition and pragmatics and process oriented studies. And that was it. 95, I finished, went back to Brazil in 1986, started off at the university and I'm there until now. Okay. Yeah, okay. so you time. settled down. Well, I settled down <laughs> after a while, after a while. Yes. You should note that at the moment you're a visiting researcher, a visiting scholar at the Autonomous University. Yes, uh, so I'm a visiting researcher, so I'm uh, in part of a program that I call Research Visitors, or it's uh, sponsored by the Catalan Research Agency yes. Agur. Okay. And then uh, I'll be in Barcelona at the Autonoma for three months teaching a course for the MA PhD students and doing research together with the Bhakti group. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just quickly, what kind of exciting research do you think young scholars should be interested in? Do you have any recommendations, any tips? Yeah, any tips. tips. Well, of course, I mean, I think any tips would be biased because... Of course, I be biased. <laughs> but if be biased, I mean, I think the m crucial question for me is just that how is it that we do what we do? Uh, not really only process-oriented studies, but then perhaps... Uh, I, I was just talking to my students yesterday uh, about a very interesting problem arising from uh, a Spanish translator of Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises. And there is a tiny little passage in there. Um, it goes into English, if I'm not mistaken, if my memory is still good enough. On top of the mountain, Jake and Brad saw the lights of the fort. And when it's translated into Spanish, it was translated uh, in sucumbre, uh, Jack, e, Bray, Brad, whoever, um, vieron las luces del castillo, the castle, mm -hmm. not the fort. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is, why is it the translator, the Spanish translator, translated fort as castle, whereas there is the Spanish word fuerte, on top of that, in having a Hemingway's novel, that fort in question is El 
Fuerte de San Cristóbal in Pamplona, which is known for historical it's not a reasons. <laughs> it's not a, definitely not a castle. Yes, yes. But why is it that the translator did that? I mean, we mm. can look at it at the product level and say, no, there was fort and castle, and, there's, and we can speculate on different reasons for doing that, or we can look at process uh, level and then try to see how that came about. But what is really interesting, and then that's what you asked me before, what is it that translators don't know, or what is it that we don't know, or what is it that we know that we are aware of? And I think that's really important for research, you know? So what is out there that we don't really know? And I think in translation there's always a lot to tell, because, I mean, if you look at source and target texts, and whatever is in between, you know, and I think that is the fascinating thing. How is it that it comes about? 